Here's one you can edit. Don't worry, but you can't learn your times tables. Every time you say collaborative, I get a dollar. Do you? Yeah. Does a kitten die? From you. From me? <laughs> <laughs> what about innovation? Five dollars. We've known each other a long time, but we haven't been friends very long. Well, that's where you and I differ. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting that on my CV, that I'm your favourite comedian. Go for it. (laughs) Your credibility will drop instantly, but go for it anyway. Two weeks in Creative Endeavour shares the stories, insights and journeys to now of social enterprises, creatives and innovators from Wellington, New Zealand. I'm your co-host, David Binstead. Secret owner of All Gold and Fabuliciouses... I'm happy to welcome back guest co-host, Jen O'Sullivan. It's me. Hello. Thank you for having me. Really grateful for episode support from BizDojo, Collider Wellington and our Patreon patrons, and also Garage Project for continuing craft beer support. Uh, Just a very quick disclaimer. Our guests here are here today in a personal capacity, talking in general terms about perspectives related to their professional practices. Our first guest is an insatiable supporter of the arts and culture, personally favouring discerning films and demanding theatre. Middle of the road is definitely not her bag. An accomplished chemist, engineer and stunt woman, that last one might not be true, she loves travel anywhere involving food, art or culture. With a Bachelor of Laws, multiple board and advisory positions and co-owner of Gibson Group, a high profile film, television and visitor attraction production company. Amongst a long list of other awards, she was awarded ONZM in 2016 for services to theatre, film and television. And her main role is currently the director at Te Oaha, the New Zealand Institute of Applied Creativity. She's a self-acknowledged optimist, pragmatist and pessimist and celebrated patron of arts and culture. Two weeks in creative endeavour, privileged, is privileged and a teeny bit scared to welcome Victoria Spackman. Hello, nice to be here. <laughs> did you like your intro? I did like my intro. Our second guest almost became a coal miner but took a different path in, into academia. Bigly into environment and hiking, science and technology and design, and a self-described unexpected success with public speaking and emceeing. Stated superpowers are a photographic memory for images, and interestingly, dyslexia, which have served him well in graduating with a film and media studies honours degree from the University of Glasgow, and subsequently a doctorate, PhD, in sociology and cultural studies from Lancaster University, UK. Visiting professor in film and media, and associate professor in design, keen traveller and collector of wit, two weeks in creative endeavour, really pleased to welcome the very learned Dr. Leon Gurevich. Thank you very much. Although I have to say, I, um, I'm going to cringe over the, the successful speaker. <laughs> no, I, I totally thought you owned the Te Papa Talks uh, VR emceeing. I oh. thought that was incredible. That's true. You did a good job of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. But I, I yeah, I... It's it's less that I feel like it's successful. I, I it's more that I enjoy it, and somehow at some point I would never have thought that I would enjoy it when I was younger. I would have always thought that I would hate standing in front of crowds and talking. Oh, so the surprise is that you like it, not that you're successful at it. He's successful well, at everything, so that's not a surprise. You you make it look easy. There's lots of things I do find very very hard. Do you know what happened? I was at a friend's wedding in France when I was about 21 and I had to give a best man speech 80% of the people in the room didn't speak English and somehow they all started laughing when I was and I realised it was something to do with the performance Uh, and I just I'd never expected that I'd be a performer in front of crowds Um, and somehow it happens Victoria, just tell me very very briefly before we get into the juicy stuff about how your week's going My week is going well, actually. I'm week five of this new role. And so every day I get to, I turn a corner and meet someone new and cool, interesting and just great. And every day I get new information about something I need to know. And every day I've got more questions. And so I've got this really full brain of great information, cool people, people trying to achieve excellent things. So it's going really well. I'm just so excited by it. Yeah, I just love that there's a building building dedicated to creativity. Like, I'm just like, I mean, and I mean, like, it's just, I think, the general idea of it. Yeah. You know, like, because, so, like, I, 
it's really nice to just apply that label to all the stuff that I do rather than going, well, I'm a producer and a performer and a director. Yeah. And sometimes I write things down and sometimes I perform them. And and, and creativity is extremely powerful and it, we all need more of it. Yes, please. And it needs to be applied and respected in loads of different places that it isn't. And part of my campaign is to bang the table on that one and, and make sure it gets the profile it deserves. Uh, so, and you know, and that building will bring some opportunities to do that. I look forward to job opportunities, just saying. Just saying, I'm getting a master's, just saying. <laughs> just saying, just saying. You're on the list. Yes. I just want to say that I've just been doing a paper in creativity uh, and I've gotten all A's so far. Just want to say, just saying. I'm deeply excited about it, as you can imagine, and I'm, I love meeting other people, particularly, well, people inside the organisation are excited about it, and there's plenty of those, but people outside the organisation, people such as yourself, who look at it and go, oh, lightning rod, and, and, you know, and get all gleeful about it, and we are hopefully, well, no, we are, I'm going to make sure we've got the opportunity to engage with people like you, out, you know, who are outside in the industry doing real work as a way to inspire the students and ensure that we're keeping up to date. I'm delighted you're delighted. I wonder, Jen, would you introduce beer number one? All right, so our first, our first beer is a Garage Project beer, of course. Briefly interrupting the show, because I wanted to introduce you to one of the Biz Dojo team members. My name is Eloise, and I work at the Biz Dojo. I'm the community coordinator here. What advice do you have for someone who's thinking about trying co-working? I think... Um, Go bigger picture, what's your eventual dream? And think about how you can get support for that because I know sometimes when you're working at home, it seems like it's all you and it's you against the world and you with just your idea. But there are so many people in this space who are not here to get up on anyone else. They're just here to be in this community, get on with their ideas, but also be there to support others. And that's what we really are like so big on here is the collaborations, working together, the growth. Like we're all here for a bigger picture reason and that's to be in something all together. And that's what I really, really love people seeing. So they walk in here and they're like, oh my gosh, like this is what I've been missing sitting at home with my dog or my cat. Like this is what I needed. And the free coffee helps as well. <laughs> Thanks, Eloise. Now back to the show. Hop lovers, do not despair. We've stretched credulity to its limits to bring you a hoppy treat 400 years before the first IPA took to the seas. To do this, we've brewed D-I-P-K, Double India Pale Kolsch. Kia ora. Kia ora. Oh, yes. Well, I think I should um, put my hand up now and be honest about the fact that I brushed my teeth just before I came out. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, how, so how does it taste to you then? It tastes like beer that you drink after you've brushed your teeth. <laughs> how about you, Victoria? Initial impressions? It's quite bitter. It looks like very strong LMP. I I like the fact that it's got some life to it. It doesn't smell like it's got life, but it tastes like it's got life. It's got some oomph and some responsiveness to it. Are you uh, Garage Project devotees already? Ironically, yes. I... I actually am. On an evening I would opt for a Garage Project IPA. How about you Jen? What are your thoughts? I like it. I don't know why. Anybody <laughs> like to take a guess of the alcohol content? Six. Six alcohols. <laughs> <laughs> Six dancing boozers. I'm going to go for 5.4. 5.4. Jen? I, four. I'm betting Victoria looked. Ah. <laughs> a, uh, a modest 7.5. Oh. It's well, incredible, isn't it? Because it tastes, tastes quite light. One without cheating. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't, I, don't, I don't know that concept. And, and, and can I just say, it wasn't a competition. <laughs> it was a conversation. Uh, but we well, do it know... Will, it will be on the next beer. Yeah, exactly. Beer. <laughs> <laughs> and we know that you think conversation's a competition. Oh, my yeah. God, I'm hiding the other beer now before... <laughs> so when would you find yourself drinking this particular brew in the future? Next time you take me out for a drink. Hey, Stuart. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> when would you drink this, Leon? Well, do you know, th that's an interesting question for me because the one thing I do miss about Britain is that the pub culture where you could go to a pub any night of the week, th there would be two or three in the town that you're in and you would be guaranteed that there would be a couple of people you know there. So it was like a second living room and you would go and drink a lot of beer with them. And in New Zealand, you have to set it up a little bit more, I tend to find. Leon, final thoughts and a score of some kind. Well, I can see that I've drank most of mine to get through the toothpaste. 
And um, uh, well, do you know the funny thing is I've actually tasted this before. I have actually drank this before. Uh, and I would I would go for a seven or an eight out of ten, which is probably not your like it scale, but good. How about you, Victoria? I like it. I I strongly like it, but I think I couldn't drink very much of it, partly because of the strength, but partly because I think it would be quite wearing on the mouth, on the taste buds. I too. Four point seven. <laughs> Four point seven. That's a that's a strongly like. Yeah. yeah. Did she I say it? strongly she like? Who's she said strongly like. Are we here? Yeah. We've got microphones. People are listening. <laughs> I am, and I'm just laughing. My just concern laughing. is that you're going to have any content at all when you start editing this down. <laughs> don't, don't. Um, That's right. Jen, lab- Jen and I'll do it later. Yeah, summary, <laughs> label design. I like it. I'm concerned that it's got a German word on it and the Silk Road didn't go all that way. It's symmetrical, and I really appreciate symmetry. symmetry. I'm not a big fan of the label, but I, at the same time, I don't pay much attention to them, generally. It wouldn't stop me from buying it, I don't think. Jen? Uh, I give it three paper bags in a corner out of five. Uh, I don't understand why, like I said, but um, it's drinkable. I am curious to see if it will stop me after a while. If I like, like what Victoria was saying about it being a little bit... I wouldn't be able to drink a whole bottle, probably. I'm going to go 3.3. 3. No, I'm going to go 3. I'm not even going to give it the point. 3 out of 5 as well. Um I tasted for this for the first time last week in the tap room and I love that they've themed a whole set of five, six beers related to a historical relevance to the, what the Silk Road was. So, future of education. Two amazing people, both doing amazing work. What is the future of education? I think the thing about education is the education should be preparing and this is no change from now, should be preparing us for life, not just for careers. Now, some of what we do within OHA and indeed within the entire education system is prepare people for careers, and that's fine, that's a part of it. But there's so much more to the education system than just that. And the important thing is to ensure that we are providing broad skills, um, broad qualities and helping people un- understand and bring things out of themselves that help them deliver to the to themselves and to their communities in the future and that doesn't drive them necessarily only into one career and then once that runs out they've got nothing so they've got you know 21st century skills essentially so i'm going to give you a dollar collaboration creativity Bing. innovation <laughs> So I have so many thoughts on this, I've got to be careful not to just keep talking. And the thing for me about um, education is about education is I think um, we underestimate how much education takes place, uh, how many people are self-educated, and I mean that even with the people that go to universities, uh, even to an advanced you know level. Um, we're in a period of enormous change right now. Um, I want to avoid being um, uh, technophilic. I want to avoid... It. There are endless... It, especially if you go back over the last 100 years, 200 years, you can see endless predictions of where education's going or where anything's going in relation to technology. And most of the time, what you find is they were invariably wrong or ridiculous. So it's. I think, you, I think you've got to be careful when you're predicting a long way ahead that the the only the only certainty with predicting the future is that on a long enough timeline you'll be wrong i think having said all of that we're in the process of an industrial revolution in cognitive labor that's similar in scale as the industrial revolution was with uh, muscular power and by that i mean i'm starting to see things in the in areas of machine learning in areas of uh, neural network in which in which we're, we're seeing computers and machines being able to do things we previously thought were only the domain of human beings, and specifically only the domain of creative human beings. Now, that being the case, there are lots of people saying education is going to die, or that the, the, the tertiary education sector will um, 
will be in real trouble. And I would say that's absolutely wrong. And I'd go back to what Victoria just said, actually. I think education is so much more than getting training in something. I think edu education is often about um, uh, connecting with networks of people. It's a, it's a, it's a profoundly social uh, process. And I think in a world where maybe uh, many, many of the jobs we previously did, jobs that we didn't necessarily really want to do anyway, in a world where lots of those jobs are increasingly less and less, I think education will become more and more important, actually. I've had an amazing afternoon reading some of your research papers. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. You get, you get through them all in one afternoon? <laughs> let's, let's just say he's quite prolific. You're so cutting. God, I love it. Yeah, yeah totally. Why do you think I got them on together? One of the things I pulled out of it was simply that some of your research suggests that creativity is becoming increasingly automated. So where does that leave somewhere like Toha saying we want to connect and bring all these people together to create the creative work? Is that not going to create the extinction of that work through automation? A lot of this technology that's, that's increasingly able to be creative, I see that as almost like potentially being free creative research assistants so you know a director makes a movie they need many many people around them to make that movie uh, um, there's a potential for technology that can aid that process allowing for a democratization you know there are lots of people that would like to be a director but they could never utilize all of the skills that they need because maybe their career just doesn't go that way um, that that the potential for those kinds of leveraging increases when you have machines that can do creative things and i also think you've got to be careful when you say it's it i mean it becomes a complex question of what is creativity and what kinds of creativity are we dealing with because i think there are also um what's interesting is what we deem as being creative the goalposts of that shift. So every time we get a machine that can do something that we previously said only creative humans could do, that then becomes something that's not creative. So, so, then, the, so then the humans fill in the next part and it, pushes exactly. the, and it pushes the humans to the next level. Exactly. The machines fill in a piece that we thought only humans can do. And what that means is that, is that those machines are pushing humans even further to even greater heights of creativity, of innovation, of opportunity to solve interesting things in interesting ways. And the more we get between disciplines and across disciplines, the more interesting that gets and the more you know, the world and society and communities benefit. Yeah, it's the whole uh, like standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, we, yeah. we, I, I start my creative practice learning about what other people have already done so that I can do the next thing. I don't, I don't have to go through the whole trial and error. There's no need for me to do that. So if you've got a machine that can do part of that for you, then, yeah. Stand on. Yeah, yeah. So, so does this relate to the dismantling of what I'd call, layman's terms, the traditional silos of science as distinctly different from art, as yes. distinctly different from, you know, w w within each of those sub-silos? Are you suggesting that they're going to be, the future is a transition towards much more uh, cross-functionality between them? Absolutely. Oh, I think so. And, I mean, there's plenty of evidence of that. And I don't think it's new either. I don't think it's a, a new breakdown. I mean, so there's stories about Einstein's brain. And Einstein was, an, an, apparently, an incredible violinist. And when his brain was dissected um, and sliced into very thin, thin pieces and photographed, apparently the brain's gone, but we still have the photographs, uh, there was a piece of his brain that was larger than normal humans. And it's the piece that has grown by playing music. So he was a mathematician working with a musical brain. And he's probably the greatest brain we talk about ever. I think we always want to think it's going in one direction or another. I think there are, there are going to be people who specialise uh, and, and remain specialised in one very, very narrow area, are very productive in, in that sense. And then there are other people who increasingly are doing exactly what Victoria said, which is, is the cross-disciplinary making connections. This distinction between the sciences on the one hand and the arts on the other is a, is a, is a false distinction. It's a, 
Yeah, yeah, and it's it, if you if you look at it, it's a really a, a product of the industrial revolution. If you if you went and if you looked if you spoke to someone like Leonardo da Vinci, I strongly suspect that he would he would have said, uh, "I'm an engineer. I'm a mathematician. I'm an artist. I'm a you know he did an architect." Uh, he did many, a designer, he did many, many things all at once and he didn't see the need for a distinction. Now, I think to go back to the computers thing, one of the things that I'm starting to see happening is computers are doing a lot of the heavy lifting of certain areas that allow for, for and the example of this would be design students. Increasingly, our industrial design students do things that the engineering department would also do. But sometimes these are design students who are terrible at maths. But they can they can do something that 20 years ago you'd have to have been an engineer to do. Um, and vice versa, I see engineers doing things. Engineers increasingly have more time to, to, to think about aesthetics uh, for the same kinds of reasons. Now, that, that's a, a certain collapsing of those silos, I think, happening there. And met, there are many other examples. You go to Weta Digital, you go to the simulations department, and you've got physicists there, you've got biologists, you've got people... Who uh, geneticists? Uh, you've got artists. The, you've got the whole gamut, really. Uh, and really, I think that's. I think we had a brief period in the industrial revolution where there was a, there was it was seen as being distinct industry or hard sciences versus the arts. The people who are out there composing music and playing music and picking music apart and putting it back together are also excellent coders. And that's. I mean, uh, there's just plenty of evidence of that. The other thing is, I mean, I've, you know, this, the, a, a book I bought on Kindle and then bought, as I said, bought on Kindle and then bought in hard copy so I could underline and wave around, is a book called The Originals. And I found the story in there about um, some research that was done on, on Nobel Prize winning scientists. And there's a, you know, a pretty large sample. And the, the research compared Nobel Prize winning scientists to normal scientists. And if you were an amateur actor, a dancer, or a magician, and a scientist, the odds for Nobel Prize winners relative to typical scientists of being a amateur actor, dancer, or magician was 22 times. So the people who combined those creative works with their science were far more successful in their science had they compared to those who didn't have that creative bent. And that flows through to you know various other plays, playing music and being um, creative with woodwork and writing poetry and all that kind of stuff. And actually, just to give you uh, um, an anecdote of that, exactly that, actually, uh, I was in California last year, and uh, one of the people that became one of my best friends in California at that point, and still a dear friend to me now, uh, he, he's a coder. He's, I mean, he, he was astonishingly smart coder. He's probably the smartest coder I've ever met so far. Uh, and you know he's got this crazy career path. He's 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 a, you know, one of these kind of Silicon Valley rising stars. Um, and I, the first time I chatted to him, he 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 nearly went and did music. And he spent his whole time playing music. When I you know when I knew him, he was always playing yeah. piano and composing. And and it exactly. was very interesting. And he talked about code as well as, as being like composing a song or writing a poem. Yeah. So I'm not in the slightest bit surprised. The, um, it's, it's almost the cliche now, isn't it, of um, writing beautiful code in, in terms of the, the aesthetic related to how not just tidiness, but the whimsy and the, the artistic style of something which is not traditionally associated with being artistic, which, which I find really interesting. Computers can be super creative and make amazing pictures, but if there's no one there to look at it and go, yeah, that's really beautiful or yeah, that's really provoking, it's not going to be actually art. So if someone's looking at a pile of code and going, that's beautiful and that really excites me, then yeah, suddenly it's art. I tried learning to code last year and the problem is, because I'm dyslexic, uh, it was punishingly hard. Was it was like having to write poetry but get all of the grammar and syntax exactly right first time. Otherwise, the poem would go up in flames. And so <laughs> trying, to, trying to learn to code was so hard. Uh, and I remember thinking, I can't wait until they can automate the process of writing code. I can't wait for computers to creatively write beautiful well, code for me. Computers, computers 
Creating computers, creating computers, yep. creating computers. HTML, right? Like, you know, WYSIWYG editors and – because that's what I learned how to I, – I learned HTML through Dreamweaver. Now you've got like Squarespace and you've got all these th- these tools that just do it for you. Yeah, and Google and Google's biggest project right now is to um, get computers to the point where you can talk to the computer and say what you want and then it will do it. That's their – that's their – one of their primary operating uh, agendas. Google, edit me a podcast. <laughs> yeah, or Google, make me a piece of software that does this, this and this. Hey, um, time to just quickly crack into brew number two that may or may not be true. Kesha is a tea from the Middle East, reimagined as a rich bock, bock beer. Flavoured with cinnamon and cascara, the dried cherry that surrounds the coffee bean. The resulting balances delicate coffee fruit and cinnamon as if they belong together in a beer. Well, that's convenient because this is a beer. It smells like aftershave. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, let's, let's, let's cheers. We should, yeah. Whose aftershave are you smelling? Did you say clove or something? Cinnamon? Cinnamon. Cascara. So, yeah, I think the cinnamon might be the aftershave. Initial impressions. I, I tasted it before I'd seen the bottle or read anything on it. So I was shocked by the difference and I liked it a lot. What is it you like about it, Leon? Firstly, I'm a big fan of cinnamon. And Second, it's very good for the heart, cinnamon. Yes, apparently so. Yeah. yeah. So it's medicinal. I'm normally a, a fan of m- m- paler ales, to be honest, but I liked the punch that this had. The, it's kind of fruity, which, again, I don't normally like fruity beers either, but... I think maybe it was just the cinnamon and the surprise and the fact that I no longer have a toothpaste mouth. What sort of aftershave? So I have a very dear friend of mine who runs a perfume company in the UK. And as soon as I smelt it, I thought of him. And so I don't know whether that's because the the last... I mean, it wouldn't be aftershave in his case. It'd be some sort of perfume. But So I'm wondering whether the last time I was with him, he smelt like that. Makes me think of Christmas. Yeah. The cloves is the cloves is it in it? Cascara, which is the, the dried cherry that surrounds the coffee bean. I was gonna say it's it's almost like a beer equivalent of mulled wine, only it's cold and slightly fizzy. It's in the field of perfect beers. It's distinctive, it's original, it's um very evocative of place, location and time. I would agree. I would totally agree. I was I was surprised by how much I like this. I'm going to give this a 4.3. Leon. I'm going to give it a 9. Out of 10? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just check it. I'm also going to give it a 4.5. And I'm going to say that I'm unlike the last one, the last one was very strong and I wasn't sure how much I could handle of it. Not only strong in alcohol, but just a kind of presence. Uh, this one, I'm guessing less alcohol that we haven't checked. Uh, but also... I'm not sure how long it would last because it might be a little weak in terms of the complexity of it. Might f- might again not not I might not last a whole bottle because it's too weak. Because it's there's not quite enough to it in terms of layer that I'm getting, which is different to what you guys are experiencing. I think you guys are getting more texture than I am. All right, how about you, Jen? Uh, I'm going. I, I like round numbers for my for my scoring. Uh, so mine is four paper bags out of five in the corner, so higher than the other one, but it's still beer. And I like I like some beers, but I don't like beer as a rule. So still four out of five. It's pretty good. I'd like to take a short break to make a short homage to one of the greatest little cities anywhere on planet Earth. If world-class recreation, arts, culture and food aren't enough reason to visit or work here, Wellington also happens to be a southern hemisphere hub for tech, digital and creative industries. A city actively supporting your personal and professional growth to build world-class, future-facing companies. Collider Wellington is a monthly program of events where fast-growing companies and clever ideas come to connect, converge and collaborate. Its purpose is connecting thought leaders, emerging entrepreneurs and inspirational experts to support the growth of the greatest little city on earth, Wellington, New Zealand. So learn something new, hang with some of the smartest people on the planet and access world-class intelligence. For all the deets, go to colliderwellington.com. That's spelt collider, W-G-T-N, dot com.
A grateful thanks to Collider Wellington and Wellington City Council for their support of this show. One of the things I'm really fascinated to ask both of you is I'm interested in your journeys to now. Leon, if I may start with you, professor at a New Zealand university, is is, is that something you aspired to be as a kid? Uh, No. (laughs) So I first aspired to be a train driver, was obsessed with trains when I was a kid. By the time I was about five, I knew the top speed of every steam train that Britain had had, which is probably an indicator of the fact that I was going to end up being some geeky academic, is the fact that... I did my research on trains when I got obsessed with them, but I didn't ever think I'd end up being a professor. Uh, But I did, I grew up on the west coast of Scotland, and I did uh, ask my teacher, Donald McGregor, once, where is, like, Scotland but has sunshine? And he said, he said New Zealand. (laughs) So, and I, recently I was looking through some, I was recovering some documents in Scotland and sending them over to New Zealand, and... I had a collage that I found that had everything that was in my head that I'd been cut out and stuck down when I was about six years old. The best piece of advice my father ever gave me, he said, do what you enjoy at this particular moment. And if you do what you enjoy at this particular moment, you'll do it well. And that will take you to where you want to go. And he was absolutely right. Because I would never, if anyone had said to me, you know, you'd be a professor of design in in New Zealand I would have thought they were completely bonkers it's almost like you're sort of you wanted to make a bet on that 20 years ago for like a million dollars or something yeah because it was so at that time in your mind so unlikely yeah and now here you are yeah I mean I thought to be honest just before I went to university I thought I was going to go and be a painter that was what I was I was into was painting and then I and then I thought actually I want to make films I, I thought if I if I was going to be an artist now I would be a filmmaker so I went last minute I got a place in Glasgow School of Art and last minute I decided not to do that and went to Glasgow University and then at the end of that I thought right okay I'll actually I'm interested in people and how people behave and human behaviors and how we structure our society so I thought I'll do a PhD in sociology. Victoria journeys to now I've got a long-standing and very strong relationship with the power of words. I, I did languages at school. I've got uh, school C and bursary and whatever else in various languages. My first degree is in foreign languages. And the law expresses that as well. The precision that you have to use for with words in the law is is very rewarding to me. I like that a lot. Um, there is a word for that, and it's pedant. But it's <laughs> my relationship with words has been really great. I'm very conscious of the power of words and the, the influence that they have. And my so theatre and film is the same. Storytelling is the same. Uh, so there's that thread that runs through everything I do. You know, even when I'm lost for words, it's because I want the perfect one. I ended up at uh, the largest New Zealand um, film and television production company for three and a bit years, and. So I was able to combine the law with the storytelling with the creativity. And then when I came back to Wellington to do a similar thing for the Gibson Group, you know, equally rewarding, different organisation. And then it's kind of progressed from there. Again, the other part of my life, the other part of what I do is creating platforms for safe environments for people to be unsafe. So safe environments for people to be creative. Victoria, I'm really curious to ask you, what is it about films that has hold such an attraction to you, as, as, even as a consumer, let alone as a patron of the arts? I love being told a story and I love being lowered into a story. So the satisfaction I get and the um, when I trust a storyteller and a group of storytellers, so a, a, a film or a theatre show, uh, are a group of storytellers coming together. The satisfaction of just going, okay, I trust you, you're going to take me on a journey, you're going to tell me something I don't know, you're going to teach me something I don't know, you're going to take me into someone else's world, is really, really satisfying. And that is, that's the, you know, when I when I pick, a, pick my favourite films, and I can't pick one, but when I pick the 77 favourite films, it's all about people I, I learn to trust who are taking me on a journey that I'm fascinated by, interested in, settled into, shocked by, demanded something of. You know, all of that. I'm very, yeah, that's, that's what I found rewarding about the films. As one of the many roles that you've either held in the past 
and also currently hold as a co-owner of Gibson Group. Do you think that that interest in and love for film and story has helped colour your professional practice? Absolutely. Um, as a as a business person, when I was running that company and you know shareholder and deeply embedded in it, I got to tell stories every day. I got to help others tell stories. I got to bring audiences and visitors along for a ride and for and and to be a visitor and audience advocate that was one of the things I did within that organization was was say you know what does an audience member say what does a visitor say what is somebody who's coming along to this as a as a new for a new experience with them how are they you know entering into this story so yeah absolutely the the storytelling part of it is is very important to me and and working with people who want to take people on a journey is really important and deeply deeply rewarding can you either of you see yourselves um, producing feature-length films yourselves in in whatever technology that is either just about to emerge or may emerge in the future? Yeah, when I um, left the Gibson Group as a day-to-day job, I was, as as you know, I retained my shareholding and my directorship of that company, and I also um, took three or four films with me. Uh, not taken in a very physical sense, but I've retained them in my heart, and I'm still working on them uh, on weekends and evenings and. 3am and all the rest of it so I, yeah I've got three or four films that I'm hoping to get up now getting up films is extremely hard you've got to have the right script with the right people with the right amount of money in the right zeitgeist to get the thing made so I'm making no promises but yeah I'm, I would really love to get the films that are sitting in my pocket at the moment and they're the ones I believe in so um, yeah I'm looking forward to that whether it happens or not is in the, the lap of the goddesses to a degree plus the luck I can create and Leon, would, uh, if you made a film, would it be about astrophotography? No. Um, uh, well, so firstly, the first thing I'd say is uh, Victoria's far more impressive than me on this score. I I mean, I really wanted to go and make films, actually, when I was younger. Um, do you know, it's really interesting. I just saw in The Guardian today an article on the film industry in Britain, and it said... Uh, that nepotism is rife, that it's very hard to get in there. The, the, in fact, the entire media in the UK, because there's runs on the internships and people who can afford to have an internship are the people who already have parents who can afford to blah, 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 blah. Totally, totally agree. So, and interestingly, I mean, so all I wanted to do was make, was, was make, was make films, actually. But, and interestingly, I kind of had a bit of an in because my, I, had a, I have a friend who has just... He just edited the most recent Star Wars movie, actually. Um, but at the time, he was working for the BBC. So I went, when I was 17, to be a runner uh, in London for a couple of weeks working for the BBC. And I, But I remember seeing the degree of nepotism that this industry had and thinking, I'm not going to be able to break in here. This is going to be punishingly hard, even with the connections I've got, because what it was was a lot of very, very wealthy uh, young people with parents that were already in the media with a free place to stay in London. And I remember thinking this would be very, very difficult. So that's actually kind of what turned me off from from going down that route. And in a way, you know, I kind of wish I'd I'd done it. But at the same time, I, I like what I do. So uh, in terms of stories, well, films, I, I'd love to make. The, the, I've always had no shortage of uh, ideas for things I'd like to make. At this point, I don't have the skills that Victoria has in terms of managing people or getting these things done all the time actually there's a there's a new center for applied creativity called to to i don't know if you've heard of it or not but uh, i i hear that they will be having filmmaking courses if if you're interested in signing up i i don't think i i I don't need to to go to a place to be taught creativity so i've got half a novel written um uh, but i've never finished it and it's it's not something that you should ever tell anyone especially not on a podcast situation. It's another truism, though, that everyone has a book in them, don't they? Oh, everyone imagines that they have a book in them. Yeah, I, that's why I wrote half of it, so that I could always pretend that, you know... I've got a book. Victoria, the business of education got this distributed group of existing um, colleges and schools, which are each specific to radio or specific to film or specific to other elements of creativity. Can you just talk to me briefly the reasoning and methodology behind why it is being combined. I think it will be powerful. I think the it's about, you know, one of our favourite words. It's about collaboration and bringing all those disciplines into one place so they can cross-pollinate. The power of 
that building as the the lightning rod for the school of creativity is that we will have amazing tutors amazing students and an astonishing facility in one place where that uh, they can mix and match and work with each other in ways that we can anticipate and a dozen ways that we can't. Resistance is a really interesting kind of touch word. I'm just curious to ask in general terms if you've met much resistance. The interesting thing about this is it's a change process and change is about loss but it's also about gain and people as a rule are very conscious of the loss but it It's hard to imagine the gain until you paint it for them. And one of my roles is to paint that opportunity, paint that gain, paint the purposes that we are working through, working towards. And conveying that is difficult, but me doing it is easy because I am delighted and excited and thrilled by the opportunity and by what it is. And I gave up, I personally gave up a reasonable amount to come and do this. I wholeheartedly uh, believe in the transformative power of creativity and being able to bring that to more people, both staff and students, and indeed the community, is what we're here for. And spreading that good word is, I mean, you know, I find that easy. It's a matter of ensuring that people are coming along with me. And and there are dozens of people who support me in that, so I'm not doing it by myself. Mm, the other thing about what Victoria just said, though, in terms of change, my experience of universities or tertiary education sector in general is that it's in a constant state of change though in a way it becomes about um, how you manage the change in a way that gets people on board I think if you're in the business of education now you're in the business of managing change all the time the 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 cliche that there are jobs that, that you're training students for jobs that don't exist when they first go in to their education is is a cliche because I think it's true fundamentally If education is about one thing and creativity is about one thing more than anything, it's actually about change. Putting two things together and making something new. I see young people doing astonishing things in education all of the time. And part of me realises it's because everything in their lives has been changing their whole lives. So they handle change very well. They handle new educational ideas. Uh, Often we learn from our students as much as our students learn from us, I would say, uh, in that process. Years ago, students would come to university and they would, they would perhaps gain, um, be, they might be looking for specific skill. You look at YouTube on any given day and it, is, it has hundreds and of thousands of skills-based videos. If you, want, if you want specific skills, you can get those specific skills. Yeah, but YouTube doesn't give you feedback. YouTube doesn't wander over and say, left a bit, right a bit, stand taller, tuck your knee in. What if you held it this way? What if you used this type of material? What if you thought about it in this way? And that's the important thing. So, so for, but for me, again, what that, what that does is, it, is it, it helps students gain specific skills. Um, it's, a, it's about feedback. It's about networking. It's about creating a learning environment. It's about learning from your peers. Uh, it's about you know, interdisciplinary stuff, and it's about learning things you didn't know you needed to know or didn't know you would learn. It's about understanding the stuff you didn't know you had to understand in order to achieve, because on YouTube or anywhere else, you'll, you'll feed what you ask for or what the algorithm feeds you. Yes. Whereas a, a good, tu- good teacher will prevent, present things that you didn't know you needed. Yes, and a good institution, which presumably is what your institution and my institution is trying to do, a good institution will put students into contexts that they might not have expected. Uh, yes. And and we can do that by encouraging them to go outside of their comfort zone. Yeah. When I, when I started my, well, I think it was the second year of my theatre and film degree, one of my lecturers said, well, this is we're establishing an environment for you to fail. And I was horrified as a you know, as the, the kind of person I am who doesn't really go in for failure, I was horrified. And it took me a year to figure out that he was absolutely right. In fact, it probably took me longer than that. And, you know, it's a safe place, a safe place to make those mistakes. Uh, and that's exactly the environment we should be creating so that you can, uh, back it, right? Fail, fail more, fail better. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, but I'd go further as well. And I'd say, if there's one thing I'm really fascinated about when it comes to education, it's not success, it's failure. 
I'm really interested in, and I and I still think we have further to go, because the thing about education is when when students do well, we feel that that's a reflection on us, and when they do badly, quite often, you see this. You see people feeling that that's a reflection on the student, and actually, I'm more interested in the students that fail and why they fail and how failing can be a positive thing. I was going to pick up on a point from from earlier in the sense there's a um, a strand in yoga teaching that says you mustn't you mustn't compliment your students because all you're doing is complimenting yourself. Having hung out for recently quite a bit in sort of startup culture on the environs or the at the edges of it. Well it's a real cliche summary view of the idea of failing fast. I think what I'm pulling out of part of what you're saying is that you're saying, well, hang on a second, as tertiary students, you can fail safe here, and also you can achieve the degree of personalization with humans, IRL, that you're never going to get through what are one of my further questions, which was about the uh, mass online um, course availability, the Coursera's, the lynda.coms, the YouTubes, as, as you've touched on. If it were a product, the only thing that you have that is defendable, and it's a very big, very important thing, is that human connection. Yes, and to, to talk about Linda and Coursera, the enrolment rates are enormous, but the completion rates are tiny. And there was, you know, five, ten, five, six, eight years ago, there was talk that, again, that Coursera's, Coursera, and their, um, Coursera and their ilk would be the end of tertiary education. And... People who are good at learning, people who know how to learn, and, and therefore probably people who've been to tertiary education already, can get online and know how to learn and will you know, potentially finish those courses. But people who don't have that, uh, that in themselves or have not learned it another way tend to get on those courses and get halfway through and not finish. They don't have the aptitude for it. They don't have the commitment to it because they are trying an environment that they're not supported in. I'm not sure that them completing the course really matters to some extent as well. I think what matters is that they're trying to do it, but also it can be a way into the kind... I mean, I think you're right. I think I think the human... You know, to go back to what we were talking about much, much earlier, which was about uh, computational creativity, et cetera, et cetera, um, nobody wants a cancer diagnosis from their iPad. I'm really curious to just take the conversation somewhere else in relatively light-hearted terms. Victoria, what was your first ever job? A, a job I had throughout my secondary school um, was working in a fabric shop. And I still, I loved it because I love fabric and I love colour and I love all that stuff. And making decisions and choosing and creating and going home and cutting things out and all that stuff. The, the legacy of that is that whenever I fold anything now, it fits in one of the three sizes of the bags that we had at the fabric shop. Still, <laughs> still yeah. 20 mumble years later. My my worst ever job. I was temping. I can't remember what year I was. I was you know. And you, when you're temping, you get all sorts of random jobs. And one of the ones I got some. It was a logistics company of some sort. I can't remember the details. But they had some new software, and they wanted to test that it was doing what they thought it was supposed to be doing. And so I spent weeks, days, comparing numbers that had been printed out of a computer to numbers that were from a physical list that people had written. And finding errors, so there were actually there were errors in what the computer was doing. That yeah, that was tedious. That was mind numbing. And best job? Every job I have, other than the terrible ones, I just progressed to something more fun and cool. So I'm loving what I'm doing, and the uh, the opportunity it's giving me and the thrills it gives me are just going to continue. Leon, first, worst, and best. First paid job. I grew up in a tiny wee village on the west coast of Scotland called Loch Goilhead. I um, cleaned holiday homes was my first job. Okay, uh, the worst is I, I worked for the Glasgow Film Theatre when I got to Glasgow, which is an art house cinema, uh, and I was so, so glad to get this job. I was so happy to get this job. And on the second night I was there, um, they were showing the Blair Witch Project, which was a handheld camera and the screen. It was, they were showing it in Cinema One, which is an enormous screen. And over the course of that night, three people came out and threw up all over the carpet, <laughs> which was a very plush carpet because it was a very posh uh, art house cinema. 
So I had to clean up three piles of sick that night. And I <laughs> I was just 18 <laughs> and I was just great. glad to have a job. That's so um, good. And I thought that this was what it would be like every night. And th- I had to think seriously about whether I wanted to come back or not. But I did. And I didn't realize it got me a lot of street cred because actually I never cleaned up another pile of sick ever again in there. But I think the fact that I just got on with the job probably, uh, it was probably why they let me come back, to be honest. Your second worst job? The, the worst job was um, when I just started my PhD in Lancaster. And I went for a, to, for a job and it was essentially a call center, but it was a call center doing surveys. Um, and I'd never worked in a call center before, but I was fairly, you know, I was okay on the phone and all the rest of it. Uh, interestingly, they were gathering data, research data for, so what was happening was research, researchers around Britain were, were um, requesting that, this, that these surveys would be done. I, I'm just watching myself drop down all day. I'm going to have to skip questions or make them up. And this other guy said, well, Obviously, that's what we all do. We make this up. And of course, I just started a PhD, so I was horrified because I, it made me realize that the, these surveys that were being conducted for academic institutions were clearly complete Bogus. nonsense. They had to be nonsense because it wasn't possible. And I remember, and it was I, because I was in Lancaster, I remember thinking, this is kind of like, this is like the, the sweat house or the work house. You know, it's like, like some kind of weird modern version of this was that the call centers i remember thinking call centers are terrible places really was my worst job. great for a sociologist who loves who loves understanding about work and society though, actually right? it was yeah it yeah. was really it was it was the best worst day of my of my working <laughs> life <laughs> and uh, what about your best job i see people in any kind of given job no matter how good it is complaining about the job that they do i feel very very privileged in what i do i feel like ever ever as soon as I got onto my PhD and started doing my PhD, I remember thinking, "This, this is very enjoyable. I, I get, I have a stipend to learn here." And I remember thinking, I, "I'm potentially going to be able to learn for the rest of my life and make creative connections for the rest of my life, and then watch other people going through uh, an education and making creative connections as well." Victoria, if you had to look back at your seven-year-old self. What advice would you give her now? Probably not my seven-year-old self, but my slightly older self needed to learn to uh, connect with people, be a bit more vulnerable, uh, make a few more mistakes, um, understand that everybody that everybody is fallible earlier. And Leon, what, what would you have done in hindsight, looking back at your younger self? I, I think this is probably the case for everyone, right? But... Um, I wasn't a very com- I wasn't a very confident kid at all, um, and I always thought that everybody else uh, had the world figured out, and I didn't at all. I'd probably tell myself that most people are kind of faking it until they make it. I listened to a, an enormous amount of talk radio when I was a kid, and I and I read a lot of books because I was on the west coast of Scotland, and I was really bored. And um, I think those those two, if it, if it hadn't been for those two doing those two things. Um, I don't think I'd have got through education, actually. Uh, I think I'd probably say, don't worry that you can't learn your times tables. If there's an analogue object, item or thing, that at the current moment you can't live without, Victoria, what would yours be? I've got this really, really great spatula. And I use it for stir-frying, I use it for baking, I use it for almost everything. And because it's so good it just cleans up you can't smell anything on it and um, it's really well you know how you get a really good tool that's weighted well this is a really well weighted tool leon how about you i have an object that's not a tool it doesn't do anything and um but it has a story i have a ring um that uh was given to me by my mother that has been in my family for a couple of hundred years it's a gold ring that was hidden under the floorboards in the Second World War in Milan um, because they had to give their rings to uh, the Mussolini government. So uh, they hid it under the floorboards and went out and bought a cheap wedding ring. Um, so it, it survived that, but it's 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 sold. It doesn't have a hallmark on it, but it, it's... Um, so it does nothing, but I couldn't possibly lose it. It doesn't do nothing. It does everything. Well, it, yes, it does. It does everything. And what I mean is, is it? I can't eat salad with it. What are a couple of the key things which are happening in your professional world? 
we are building this school. Um, well, the school exists. We're bringing it into almost into entirely into one building. So as people see it growing on the corner of Cuba and Dixon, um, think of me, think of us, and think of the amazing work that's to come. If your kids or you are interested in the creative arts, then you know get in touch because uh, it's going to be a pretty amazing first year that we're building. And when a MacBook Pro. The big A from Te Oaha, uh, which is on the side of the building and elsewhere around town, you can download that A and mess with it in any way you like. Uh, only thing is keeping the dimensions of it and send it back to us. And if we love it, we'll put it on our Facebook page and you might win a MacBook Pro. So yeah, get amongst that. Upcomings for yourself, Leon, in terms of uh, work, other professional interests and activities. First, I'm going to be... Um shamelessly promotional about the the school of design we have two programs a user experience program uh on the horizon and uh we also have a communications design program so both of those programs are in the process of starting uh they're going to be fairly major for us because we're going to move from having three programs to having five programs where can we find you both, respectively, publicly, online? I'm on Twitter. My handle is Victorian Purple, as in Victorian, as in the age of Victoria, Victorian Purple. I'm on Twitter, although I don't use it an awful lot, but I am on Twitter, so at Leon the Vich. Hey, you can connect with Twice Podcast on Twitter and Instagram at Twice Podcast, or via email, twicepodcast at gmail.com. It just leaves me to thank our supporters and sponsors, Biz Dojo, Collider Wellington, our Patreon patrons, beer supporters, and firstly, Victoria Spackman, ONZM. Thank you ever so much for giving time this evening. It has been a great pleasure hanging out with you guys. I missed Jen the second half, but it, it was, yeah, this was fun. And secondly, Leon Garovich. Thank you very much. It was a, it was a lot of fun. Students that are anxious about failing want to get the best grades possible in order to get the best jobs that they can. When you talk to parents at parents' evenings around New Zealand, um, one of the first questions I get asked over and over again is, what kind of jobs can my son or daughter um, get when she gets out of university? What, what, will, what will be the kinds of jobs that she can get? And how successful is your institution at, at, at placing... now? All of that's very interesting because it, it has an effect on the kind of education, uh, the kind of goals people have, but also the way they approach it. I think the, the most fantastic thing would be if the, th the, the concept of failure never even entered into the educational process. If, 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 it, if it wasn't a question of whether you fail or not, but just what you learn. Um, and I think that, would be an, that, that may be an interesting direction in which education could go if it's not all about a workforce. It's not about failing courses or failing qualifications. It's about the journey through which you discover what you can do and the limits of that. And if you're shaking right on the edge of something and falling off, then you know that that's the point where you don't go this time, but you might go next time. And that's what failure's about. The other thing is I think there's a distinction between a university and a polytechnic or a... Um, vocational education in that because the institutions that I'm involved with now are are more directed towards vocation and applied and that's their place within the tertiary education sector and that's as valid as what you're doing and it's appropriate for the students that want to come to us so and and also we are providing them with a wider world knowledge as well but we have a a tighter focus on on vocational education. Like the parents and caregivers saying to you, what jobs can they get? I just wonder how brave the lecturers and professors are to say absolutely any job they want. Because I, th I think that requires bravery to challenge the question. The thing that I find myself saying to parents and students is uh, that really depends on on the kind of what the the path you take during your education, and um, I advise any student that comes into my office and says, "How do I get a job?" I say, "Well, you do this, and at the same time, you try to get jobs in the kind of area 
while you're studying, if you're if you're someone who's studying and is doing jobs at the same time, which large amounts of students do now, I'd say try to try to work towards the kinds of industry that you're interested in being in further down the line. Hey, uh, our second guest, I'm going to give you two intros. The first one, and then he just saved it by actually getting me some info. Our second guest takes photos and writes a bit. Two weeks in Creative Endeavour, pleased to welcome Northern Man Leon Gurevich. That was the whole intro. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but because he just snuck I'm glad in I under that email in just under the wire, <laughs> snuck in under the deadline. Gurevich, Victoria University, Wellington. Just a few quick fire uh, questions. What year was the university established? <laughs> <laughs> um, Got to rush you. 1904. Uh, uh, 1897. 1997, wow. Average research grade global ranking. I do know that all the universities in New Zealand are in the top 3% in the world. Victoria right. University Wellington motto. I'll take either Latin or English. I'm getting fired. What's that in Latin? <laughs> <laughs> A current uh, student intake total. Victoria University, Wellington. To the, I'll, I'll give it to the nearest thousand. Uh, we've got about 20,000 in total, I think. I'll take the first answer. Uh, I've got the uh, last record, 21,202. Spackman to Oaha. Name some of to Oaha's ambassadors. Barnaby Weir. Ding. Dame Fiona Kidman. Ding. Gino. Ding. Scott Hansen. Ding. Malia Johnston. Ding. Dame's is Dame Susie. Complete round. Maori meaning of title. So the Maori meaning of Te Oha is around formation, creation, innovation. It's a really great word for what we're doing. Nice. Yeah. Ding. I'll give you that one as well. It's going to switch from yellow to purple. You're excited about the yellow? When I interviewed for the job, I said to the CEO, how married to the yellow are we? <laughs> <laughs> Told you. One of one of the audience questions was, get her to talk about her affinity with purple and the origin story there. 